Hold on. Okay, we're good. This um, culminating on uh, Saturday, April 22nd at the Emerson when we will have an Earth Day festival. Um, and then also on that day, we are also um, hosting a, in partnership with the um, Sacagawea Audubon and the Wind Drinkers, we're hosting a fun run. It's a 5K fun run to raise money for the Inland Audubon Wetland Preserves. If you're not aware of it, it's a great little new preserve that is just off of Main Street in downtown Bozeman here. And um, interesting enough to everyone who loves trout fishing, the wetlands is a very crucial um, key partner in helping us filter the water that goes into the East Gallatin. And the East Gallatin, I've been told, is the most threatened um, trout fishing river in the state of Montana. So, so this um, wetlands is really, really important for helping the East Gallatin. So if you have any friends who like to walk or uh, run a 5K, I encourage you to get out and um, sign up for that on our website. So um, once again, I'm so thrilled to see all of you here in our audience tonight. And I'm uh, sending out a big welcome to all of you who are joining us online. As I noticed, we have people all the way from Australia to Texas to Maine to uh, lots of cities all throughout Montana joining us tonight, so welcome. My name is Ann Reddy, and I am the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee. And uh, we're so lucky to have Connor Parrish from Trout Unlimited with us um, tonight um, because his talk is really timely and important. I don't know if any of you are aware, but um, this last September, the U.S. Geologic Survey in partnership with some scientists from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and the University of Montana published a report um, that deals with, well, they studied how climate change affects trout fisheries in Montana. And they looked at over 3,100 rivers throughout Montana from 1987 to 2017. And the result of that report said that um, the trout fishing um, economy in Montana actually was quite resilient to some of the effects of climate change. However, by 2080, they predict that we will lose 35% or more of our current trout habitat because it will just be too warm and trout will no longer, it will no longer be suitable for trout. And this will result in almost $200 million um, a year lost to the state and revenue from our trout industry. So it is a big deal and it's, it's sort of sobering, but um, Gallatin Valley Earth Day, we like to present an issue and then say, hey, you know what? We can do something about this and we have solutions. So therefore I am bringing you Connor uh, with his talk solutions for Montana's trout fisheries facing a warming climate. Um, <clears throat> I'll introduce Connor in a moment, but before that, I'd really like to thank some um, underwriters for our event. And I realized that I mentioned, I just wanted to quick show you Earth Day Fun Run on the 22nd. And okay, now we're off to our partners for tonight. Um, the the Madison Gallatin Trout Unlimited has generously um, uh, given us some money to support tonight's event. And so has Montana Angler. If you don't know, it's a great trout shop down on Main Street here in, um, in Bozeman and also Trout Unlimited. We're very grateful to them for being our partners for this event. And uh, also I'm really thankful to um, to our premier sponsors, uh, this event and all our other events are only possible um, because of the generous support from a lot of nonprofits and businesses and um, local government agencies who support us. And our premier sponsors are the city of Bozeman and Audi Bozeman and Gallatin Subaru. And also we have a benefactor sponsors of Sacagawea Audubon, Montana Parent Magazine, and um, our stewards are Happy Trash Can, Valley of the Flowers Landscaping, Bozeman Green Build, and the Gallatin Wildlife Association. And I just wanted to thank the Hope Lutheran Church for providing us with this venue tonight, and our great tech team of Lorreen Reed from Sacagawea Audubon Society and Taylor Burlage. So um, <clears throat> let's see. 
And oh, also, I don't want to forget, we have tons of volunteers from the community who are helping this um, all happen. And uh, so now I guess I'm on to our program. But before I introduce Connor, I just wanted to um, uh, let you know that if you're visiting um, this presentation online, uh, if you look on your screen, there are some handouts. Um, one of them is from Trout Unlimited. And um, another one is from um, another group that I'm aware of that does really great work on helping um, with climate change. We're talking about solutions tonight and Citizens Climate Lobby is actually a very highly respected um, lobbying group on Capitol Hill. And they're totally grassroots, nonpartisan, and they're doing really great things to help change you know, things around so that trout fisheries will um, be more viable in the future. So um, I encourage you to go check them out. You can find them, citizensclimatelobby.org um, online. And um, also, uh, I wanted to also say that after the talk, we will be having a question and answer period when Connor's done with the presentation. So if you're online, if you look on your screen, there's a little column running down the right side of the screen. If you go part way down, there's a question box there. So just type in your question there, and then um, Rich here will um, read the questions to Connor so he can answer them for you. If you're in person here, I will be going around with a microphone and just raise your hand, and I'll come to you and you can ask Connor your question. So, now I'm finally pleased to introduce Connor Parrish. He is the program manager for Trout Unlimited and he's based here in Bozeman, Montana. Before that, he spent nine years in the Pacific Northwest uh, in the Columbia River Basin where he focused on fisheries research and habitat restoration for steelhead, salmon, and bull trout. Uh, currently, Connor is focusing on habitat and water quality issues impacting the Gallatin watershed's treasured trout fishery. So now, without further ado, if you could help me, please give a warm welcome to Connor, and I'll hand him over. Appreciate the introduction. Excited to be here and be able to talk to all of you about uh, a topic that I think is really important. Um, I do really want to emphasize, though, that. Uh, this topic is like a huge topic and it could be, you know, you could teach an entire like college course on this. So today I'm going to try and give you like a very high level overview of, of some of the solutions for um, Montana's trout fisheries and a change of climate. Um, but also I'll give you a bit of overview on how climate changes can impact our rivers and therefore our fish. Um, real quickly, as, um, as Ann said, so I, I'm the project manager for the Gallatin Home Rivers Initiative. This uh, initiative was kicked off two years ago, and it was actually in a partnership with Sims Fishing Products. So Sims provided uh, base funding for the first three years, which helped support my, my um, position here. So I just want to thank them for um, giving me flexibility with my funding to be able to go out and, and talk to folks. So um, I think it's really important to highlight the different trout species when we're talking about climate change. And to start off with, I always want to highlight our native fish species, because in Montana, we only have na uh, three native trout species that live in our, that are native to our streams. So we've got bull trout. Bull trout are absolutely one of my most favorite fish. Um, I've worked with them quite a bit in Washington. Um, you can only find them on the west side of the divide in our state. They grow really large. Um, they're these like apex predators. They're amazing. I'm not gonna talk a ton about them today. Um, the issues with bull trout are really complex and uh, because I don't work on, in Western Montana, I don't wanna not do them justice and go too in depth on them. However, um, on this side of the divide, we do have West Slope cutthroat. Um, we have some of those in the Gallatin, Madison, Jefferson, and also up on the east side of Glacier Park. And then we've got the Yellowstone cutthroat, which of course are native to the Yellowstone uh, watershed. So then we've got our beloved uh, introduced trout that we have in our streams. Uh, we have brook trout. Brook trout, bur, blah, brook trout are, east, are native to eastern uh, United States. And then we've got rainbow trout, which are primarily native to uh, the west coast, so the Columbia Basin where I used to work. 
Um, they're over there, and then the brown trout are actually uh, introduced from Europe. So these fish are incredibly important to all of us. I know I enjoy catching them. I know I'm sure many of you enjoy catching them, and they've become like kind of honorary uh, natives. So we usually refer to them uh, to be wild fish, and the other ones to be native fish. So I'll probably use that terminology. Uh, one really key thing, though, is that no matter whether they're a native fish or they're an introduced uh, trout, all of these trout species are cold adapted species. So they evolved in climates and in conditions where they were surrounded by really cold water and that's where they do their best. So these are relative terms. I'm sure there's some people would argue with me on some of the, the uh, preferred and lethal limits that I have for these species. But in general, what you can see is that our native fish have really poor tolerance for warm water. And even our introduced uh, species also have some pretty uh, cold water temp uh, requirements. So going forward in a changing climate where we're gonna probably see some warming events, that's gonna to be to the detriment of the more cold um, adapted species. So bull trout are by far the most cold adaptive. They're probably gonna have uh, the hardest time. So I want you to just kind of keep these relative things in mind and especially our rainbow and brown trout, they have the highest tolerance for, for warm water. So that bodes well for them moving forward in a climate change scenario. So um, I'm not going to talk about climate change, any of its mechanisms, how it's been created or anything, but we're going to talk about what climate change is going to, how it's going to impact our streams, and then that'll help us talk about how it's going to impact our fish, and hopefully how we can find some solutions. So this first slide here is basically, we're going to see increased average air temperatures. I'm sure you're all aware of this. Um, these two images here are basically two different climate change scenarios. We've got the A scenario and the B scenario. These are two different scenarios. One is more extreme than the other. But what you can see here, I don't expect you to actually read these uh, numbers here. But what you can see is that we're going to experience warming anywhere from four to um, 10 degrees over the, uh, between now and uh, the end of the century. And primarily, it's going to impact western Montana uh, the greatest. And that's where the majority of our trout species are. Because we're going to have increased uh, warmer air temperatures, that's going to result in increased frequency of rain events. So right now, we get most of our, our precipitation during the winter, uh, late fall, and early spring, and then it stays in our headwaters in the form of snowpack, slowly melts, and feeds our streams throughout the year. So that's going to change. Um, we're going to start getting more rain events, and that's going to impact our, our snowpack. So this graph, these blue and red lines correspond to those that first image I showed you, the two different scenarios that have been modeled. And so either scenario, you can see that there's a decrease um, on the y-axis here on, the, on this side. It's a snow water equivalent. That basically is snowpack. That's just the amount of water that's actually in snow. And you can see that that's decreasing over time. So we're going we're gonna to be dealing with that reality. And so this is a hypothetical um, hydrograph that I, I drew. If you guys aren't, aren't familiar with hydrographs, basically we've got stream flow on the y-axis here, and then we've got uh, months on the, on the x-axis. So the blue line I drew is kind of typical of what we'd see in the Gallatin or the Yellowstone. Last year, we saw our peak runoff right around mid-June. Um, the red is what we're probably going to see in the future. Because it's going to be warmer on average, that's going to shift. So our runoff event is going to occur earlier in the year. And that means that we're going to be going into these low flow conditions earlier on in the summer. And so there's going to be a longer period of time where our streams can warm. And that's when we start encountering problems for our fish and also when most of us like to be out there fishing. So this, this can impact us in a variety of ways. And when we have lower base flows, that's a little smaller volume of water, less water heats up faster and hot water for trout is not a great thing. Um, on top of all that, we've got water withdrawal. So right now, you know, we've got water uses for agriculture, domestic and municipal uses. We're punching in more wells. Um, we've, and with a growing population with folks moving to Montana, like myself, I'm guilty of it too. Um, you know, there's, there's an increased demand for this. So this is something we have to, to deal with going forward too, not just our declining snowpack. So um, with that in mind, what does warm water do to trout? So first of all, one of the physical properties of water is that cold water holds more oxygen or has a capacity to hold more oxygen than warm water. Um, trout, once again, evolved in cold water. So when they get in warm water, their bodies aren't adapted for those conditions with lower oxygen. In fact, as their, metabol as their metabolism increases with warm water, they also their oxygen demand also increases. So at the same time, when we have decreasing oxygen because our water is warming up, their demand is going up. So it's not a great situation for them. 
Um, when their metabolism is going faster, they're burning through their fat reserves. They can't um, put on weight so they can survive through harsher times of the year or um, be as successful during spawning. Uh, that leaves them vulnerable to disease and um, they will change their behavior. So their first option, the cool, really great thing and like the saving grace with our trout is that trout are really good at moving. And um, for those of you that think that fish just hang out in one pool their entire lives, that's not the case. There, that might be the case for some fish, but especially in our big river systems, those fish are moving all the way, all up and down the stream to take advantage of different resources. However, if they're in a scenario where they can't move and find colder water, they'll just hunker down, try and wait out that warm spell. And if they can't uh, survive it, then they'll eventually, you know, perish. So um, this next um, few images that I'm going to show you are, are models. So this comes from the Norwest stream temperature model. This is a map. Anyone can go online and find this and you can look up your favorite stream and, and see how it changes in this model scenario going into the future. So I adjusted it. So I put Fahrenheit here now. So it's a little bit easier to, to explain, especially in the context of um, those fish tolerances that I showed you for the temperature range. Um, what I want you to really look at is this um, red line. So down at the bottom, we've got the 68 to 86 degrees. So those are, that's the temperature when pretty much all of our fish, whether they're introduced or not, are going to start feeling uncomfortable. Rainbow and brown trout will still be doing pretty good in a lot of those temperature ranges. But remember, brown trout can't take it past 80 degrees either. So we've got, this is kind of focusing on the headwaters of the Missouri. So on the left, we've got the Jefferson. In the center, we've got the lower Madison. On the right, we've got the Gallatin. And then Anne was talking about the East Gallatin, which is kind of up on the right there as well. And so this is kind of our current or historic um, model. So this is taking real-time stream data. They build it into this model to develop this historic um, image here. So we're going to bounce forward, and then their model is going to predict what it would look like in 2080. And what you see is that a lot more of that red starts showing up. So when, the, when this red starts showing up, that means the fish are gonna have to adapt to these conditions. So primarily their best way to cope with these are, are gonna be to, able to move. They're gonna need to either look for a cold water refuge. Um, this, the resolution on this, as far as like the scale of how they can measure these projected heat, um, isn't like, it isn't very, uh, very fine scale. So they're predicting this on a large scale. Within a river system, typically there's all kinds of different changes in temperature. So there might be spots in here where it's cooler than other places. So fish will try and find those cool cold water refuges, whether there's some groundwater upwelling input coming from a tributary, sometimes they'll swim up a tributary, or they'll just keep going way up a, a, the main stem river and try and get to some cooler water. But of course, if they can't, um, things don't look real great. So now I'm gonna zoom in and we're gonna just compare two streams that are very different. So we're gonna look at the lower Madison and then we're gonna look at the, the Gallatin and kind of compare and contrast those two. So any of you uh, that aren't familiar with the, with the lower Madison, um, there is a dam right below Ennis Lake, which does not have fish passage on it. So when you go from this historic scenario to the 2080 scenario, those trout aren't gonna be able to swim up past this dam to get away from the warm water, right? So they're gonna have to find other ways to adapt to it. The problem with the lower Madison is that there's only three really main tributaries that offer much for habitat for fish. Um, one of them is Warm Springs Creek, which is pretty small, doesn't have that great of passage. Um, then we've got Cherry, uh, Cherry Creek, um, which has some decent habitat in it, but it, it doesn't have a lot that's available to them. And then um, the Elk River uh, is really degraded. So that might be a good opportunity to try and enhance that and restore it so we can maybe have some more capacity for fish to go in there. But going forward, we don't know exactly how fish will adapt to this. They might completely bail on this for seasonally, move up the Gallatin, and then come back here um, during cooler months out of the year. We'll kind of have to see. But if this is a place that you're really used to fishing um, in, the, in the future, we're going to run into some challenges. So compare that to the Gallatin. The Gallatin is one of those streams that is going to hold up pretty well in the face of climate change. So it's primarily rainbows and brown trout in this stream, but all of these temperatures that you're seeing here are things that they can tolerate or, or do pretty dang well in. And also because there's no dams on the Gallatin, they can move upstream. And the Gallatin holds its snowpack really well, the way it's oriented facing north. Uh, a lot of its snowpack stays really long, so its tributaries stay cold. So um, the Gallatin is what we you know, consider like a refuge stream for trout going forward in the future. And there's several of these all over the state. I'm just focusing on this since we're in this area and talking. But um, you can go on the, online, go to the Northwest data set, and you can look at all these different streams if, if you're curious. Um, one thing to consider is that even in here where the temperatures are, um, 
are changing, uh, but they're still tolerable for fish, they're going to still shift their distribution during the warm months upstream. So uh, even anecdotally in 2021, when we had our big drought, I helped FWP do some of their electrofishing up by Big Sky, and we were running into a more um, brown trout than they'd never seen before. And that's because they were responding to those warm water temperatures and shifting the distribution upstream. So in the future, you might see more brown trout higher in our watersheds. So this is a graphic that came out of one of those um, uh, studies uh, that was recently published that played into the one that Tim Klein's going to talk about when he does his talk in, in a week or two. And so this is a little hard to understand, but basically there's two different bars here for each species. So the closed circle has error bars on it, so does the open circle. And what you're looking at is how the percent occupancy, so you can think of this as like stream miles, how that's changed over time. So in the past, you can see, you know, bull trout have been declining for a while. They're predicted to um, decline quite a bit more going into this um, climate change in 2080. Cutthroat, their numbers are looking like they're gonna decline. Brook trout are kind of holding steady. And then rainbow and brown trout are pretty much staying even or actually increasing their distribution. However, you have to remember that their sh while their distribution might or their occupancy might um, expand, they're probably going to shift their distribution upstream. So some of those lower, um, warmer areas where we currently can fish for them for a lot of the year, they might not occupy that seasonally or at, at all. Um, so maybe you're not really into native fish, maybe you're not a nerd like me and you really like catching cutthroat more than anything else. Um, so maybe you just, you just care about catching a trout, you know, something with a caudal fin just is all you really need. So if that's the case, um, how is this going to impact you? So a big way is emergency fishing closures. Closures. So I'm sure many of you are aware of our hoot owl um, restrictions. That's why I threw this little goofy cartoon on there. But um, basically, FWP monitors stream temperatures. Anytime they exceed 70 degrees for three consecutive days, they shut down fishing from 2 p.m. to midnight. And if it continues to warm, they'll shut it down for the entire day. So we see this a lot in our in our summer months, especially on places like the Lower Madison, Lower Jefferson, uh, the Bighorn, um, and even the Lower Gallatin. And so we're going to see this more going into the future. And so those of us that are, are used to getting off work and going and fishing the East Gallatin in the middle of the summer, um, that's, that's the number of days we're going to be able to do that is going to shrink. Um, additionally, the fish species are probably going to move upstream. And so we're probably going to shift our pressure upstream. So there's going to be more fishing pressure upstream. So with the Gallatin holding up really well, you already know how uh, busy it gets on, on the Gallatin when you see all the people fishing when you drive by. It's, it's likely to increase, uh, increasingly get busy because that's going to be the main option during like August. So I know that's a little bit gloomy, but fish can swim. So that's really great. So if we can provide them options so they can move around and find cold water and increase that, we can help build in resiliency to these populations. Uh, we're really lucky in Montana. We have a lot of cold water and like this is a, a pretty great state for trout moving forward in the future. So it's not all like the end of the world. Um, so there's three main buckets on how we try to uh, address or find solutions. So increasing stream flows, improving habitat and reconnecting habitat. So the first one, increasing stream flow, um, there's, there's nuance in here, um, but one thing we can do is improve irrigation efficiency. So um, I'm sure if there's agriculture folks in the room or, or online, um, this isn't a, a every single scenario, yes, let's increase irrigation efficiencies. There's some places where leaky irrigation can actually benefit our rivers by groundwater recharge, but there's other places where it makes the most sense to switch to a more uh, water efficient center pivot um, they can actually improve agricultural output and use less water, um, which can then leave more water in the stream for fish. Also, you can pipe irrigation ditches, which can reduce the leakage and also cover them up so they aren't getting heated up by all the sun and also evaporating water. So that leaves more water in our streams. So this is something Trout Unlimited, um, NRCS does a ton of this stuff, the Natural Resource Conservation um, Society <laughs> Service. <laughs> okay, too many acronyms today have been on... Uh, uh, fisheries training call all day and it's been very acronym heavy. Um, the other thing we can do uh, is we can lease water rights, purchase them or accept donations. So uh, Trout Unlimited does a lot of this currently in southwestern Montana. Um, our local Trout um, Unlimited folks here in Bozeman, we have some really great water law experts, which is like not my area of expertise whatsoever, but they're fantastic at it. We currently hold 16 water right leases on streams and tributaries in southwest Montana that can account for up to 140 CFS or cubic feet per second. Um, and so during different times of the year, that's really significant, helps keep more water in stream for a fish. 
Uh, this is attractive to landowners um, in many ways. If their agriculture operation changes and they don't need to use as much water, this can kind of help them bring, get in some more income. Um, it also protects their water right. They can lease it to us and then they can get it back after the lease is up if for some reason they want to sell it because it is valuable. Um, or maybe a landowner is changing what they're doing with their property. And so they want to sell that to us so they can, so they can gain some money or you can do a tax write off. So there's a variety of different reasons why people might want to lease water and that's a great tool going forward so we can keep more water in streams. Um, another option is reusing water. I'm sure some of you have heard about this, but this is super common in, in the desert Southwest um, and, and some in Montana, there's golf courses that reuse um, treated wastewater um, effluent um, that has been treated. So it's, it's, you know, it's just fine stuff to, to use and that can kind of uh, take the pressure off our streams. So instead of drawing irrigation water out of the streams, we just reuse water that we're already using in our homes and then they can recycle it and, and help keep their, their ag operation going. Um, the Yellowstone Club, um, I know everyone likes to joke about the movie stars skiing on poopy snow, but um, this is like a really good thing. So uh, Shroud Unlimited was very supportive of this. The Yellowstone Club has made snow for a long time and now they've switched over to using treated effluent to make that snow instead of um, just taking more water out of the ground or out of the stream. And what that does is now we're taking that effluent that was about to run off in the middle of the winter and leave our basin. It's now getting turned into snowpack, which then can melt in June. So that's a super beneficial thing. So um, the next thing, this is kind of more nuanced. This is mainly what I do for my job um, is try and improve habitat. So in order to improve, know how to improve habitat, we have to know where we came from. So I'm going to launch and do a bit of a soapbox here about uh, what streams used to like look, by, look like and how they've become impaired. So this is the South Platte River, obviously not here, uh, but I think this is a really great example of what a lot of our streams look like historically. So uh, streams are, are naturally very messy. Um, we're very used to seeing single thread channels. That wasn't super common. There's places where that's a normal stream system, but in a lot of our valleys, they look like this with crazy beaver dam complexes. You can see a beaver pond off to the left of the stream there and the water kind of going everywhere. And this is a really inefficient way for water to, to leave our headwaters and make it all the way out to you know a main stem river. And we want inefficiency when it comes to our water for our fish. So the main drivers of this uh, complexity that was making these systems, you know, be really dynamic and inefficient uh, were beaver dams. So this is one of the big things that we'll talk about here. They do a great job. Obviously, they're dams. They hold back water. Um, they create a lot of habitat for fish, great hiding cover, and it slows the flow. Uh, in our headwater streams or in places where we have um, cottonwood, uh, large wood is really important. So naturally trees age, they fall over, fires happen, they fall in and they create great habitat. They also slow the flow. They also just like beaver dams help spread water out onto the floodplain. And when water goes out on the floodplain, it gets absorbed through the soil. And then that slowly makes its way back to the stream. And so that water moves so much slower going through the soil than it does going right down our stream that that feeds our streams later into the year. So we'll have more water later in the season. On top of that, wood just makes great fish habitat. Pain to fish, but makes great habitat. Um, this is the, the Gallatin, and um, I'm sure many of you see the Gallatin has tons of log jams on it. Historically, that thing was probably like completely covered in log jams to the point where no one was taking a raft on that and living. Um, so it's, it's still got some great log jams on it, which is awesome, but historically would have had a lot more, again, increasing that floodplain connection. So I made this drawing, it's kind of nerdy, um, but uh, I had an advisor who told me if, you, if it's hard to explain something, make a cartoon. So um, anyway, so in this example, we've got precipitation coming from the uplands. It makes its way downhill, and then it hits this uh, valley bottom. And this, in this scenario that is like a really healthy connected floodplain and healthy river system, everything's lush green. And that's because this river is meandering. It's moving really slow. It's got side channels. There's beaver dams holding back water. There's log jams. You've got these uh, stream-associated wetlands. And the water table you can see is really high right with the stream. And that's, that's super important and that's kind of what we're looking for and it helps store that water and take it, make it be super inefficient getting out of our basin. So this is, we always use the analogy of a sponge, water comes off the uplands, hits that area and it, all that organic matter and soil absorbs it and then slowly releases it um, into the stream later in the season. 
But um, we have impacted our stream significantly um, over the last couple hundred years. Um, one caveat is I am not vilifying these people whatsoever. I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures from the Gallatin Valley. I find them fascinating. I nerd out trying to find these things. This is like my favorite time period to read about stuff. Um, these people were scratching by and doing some amazing things to try and make a living for the family. But it has impacted our streams and we just need to talk about it so we know what we, where we can improve things. So the first real impact was the fur trade, and this impacted our streams absolutely everywhere. So, you know, we think about our national parks not being impaired, they've been impaired because beavers were pretty much trapped out of those areas for a long period of time. So the fur trade in the early 1800s and like peaking in the 1840s, they were trapping beavers to make hats, the fashion trend. I know it would look really nice now. I don't know why we don't bring it back. Um, but anyway, there was something like 500 million beavers and now that number is like a fraction. So um, when beavers um, were trapped out, they were no longer around to maintain those dams. And so if you know anything about beavers, their dams blow out and they fix them after the spring flows. When you aren't fixing them, they fall apart. And when no one's there for a long time, the river starts just cutting down through them. And when they cut down, the river straightens out. It drains all that um, sediment out really and water really quickly. So you're not storing it any longer. So then we've got mining. Obviously mining causes a lot of disturbance and a lot of it was like hydraulic uh, mining. And so by nature of this type of work, you just really efficiently send water off the landscape. And so when people were done mining, they didn't like put it back the way it was, right? So we're still dealing with that today. Uh, timber harvest, I talked about trees falling in and making great habitat. Um, harvesting them, you know, we didn't have the regulations that we do now. We logged things all the way down to the stream. In fact, logging next to the stream was the easiest thing to do. And so we removed age classes of trees that would have fallen in and provided that really great um, log jams and habitat. And they're just not there. They're still not falling into the stream because it takes a long time for some of these trees to grow. And then we used to do log drives and log drives are probably one of the most destructive things um, we did to our river. I find them fascinating. Um, but so these are pictures of the Gallatin completely filled with logs. And so we were primarily feeding um, the railway who was who were building railway ties. And so what they would do is they went all over the upper Gallatin, pretty much everything you, you imagine has been logged at some point and has grown back. And so they would cut them into the appropriate sizes. They would build these temporary dams called splash dams out of wood. When the water backed up behind them and all that wood that they've been building up behind them um, was completely filled, they dynamite the dams and send all this water and wood like flying down the stream to a mill. And I can only imagine what this would have looked like and sounded like, it would have been incredible. Um, so that, as you can imagine, would be pretty destructive. Um, also, they would go through and clear out all the log jams that were already in the stream so that these logs could make it past them. They would close off side channels so they wouldn't lose logs. So they really manipulated the stream and then they impacted it more with these log drives. Um, agriculture, once again, agriculture is great. We all depend upon it, but um, it, it's really impacted um, our, our state and our valleys, especially our river bottoms. So the majority of the fertile soil that we have, um, like in the East Gallatin, for example, um, was there because beaver dams had trapped sediment for eons, right? Um, but when we wanted to farm it, that stuff was really swampy and wet. So you have to dry it out in order to make the conditions for us to grow um, our agricultural products. So you can put in ditches, water goes to the lowest point, drains off the, off the landscape really quickly. Put in tile drains, drain water off the landscape really quickly. So seen a trend with the <laughs> draining everything really quickly. Um, roads and railways. The best places to build roads and railways are in a valley bottom. This is going up Bozeman Pass where you can see that car on the left that's now I-90. That's the railway and then in many places this, that's Rocky Creek and it, there's another road in there quite often. So Rocky Creek which is pretty much the upper um, East Gallatin was really this sinuous stream and had all this well-connected floodplain. Now it got shoved all the way to one side and it's just like locked in a straight shot and it drains all that water really quickly. Um, Overgrazing, cattle and rivers can totally coexist, but if you give them unfettered access during the summer months, they just hang out in the stream the whole time. I would do the same thing, I don't blame the cows. So uh, it's really hot, they just hang out in the stream and they trample all the stream banks, it overwidens the stream, they kill all the vegetation, and then it's really shallow so the water warms up really quickly, that sends more warm water downstream. Um, so, you know, this is what we kind of are wanting to have and what has happened through those different disturbances is basically we, we've got a lot of this. So our streams have become in size. So basically what that means is when, when we remove some of these different habitat elements or straighten the channel manually, 
the stream, all of its power um, is now going straight instead of being like dissipated through all these meanders and flooding. Now it's all locked in one channel. It goes straight down and it just starts down cutting and eating into the ground. And with that, the water table follows it. So it, that dries out all the valley bottom that used to be green. And now all those um, plants that used to live there can't live there anymore because there's no water available to them. So it dries it out. And then what we're left is like dry tolerant species. And we're missing all the willows and stuff that would have shaded our streams and kept them cool. So the water's warming up and it's draining off really quickly. So this is what we've got now. Um, this is the East Gallatin. It's still got that sinuosity, which is awesome. Um, but you can see um, compared to that ideal um, picture I showed you, we don't have those random channels all over the place. There's not willow shading the stream. There's not all that floodplain stuff. It's all been drained. Um, and also you'll see we're missing all of this riparian area. And so over time, the stream is gonna just straighten itself out. It's already kind of eaten through some of those things that'll just straighten itself out over time. Um, and it's eroding. So you can see the banks on the East Gallatin, pretty much everywhere you go, it's eroding. So it's, it's down cutting because all that power is eating away at the stream bed. So that's, it's draining water much more efficiently. This is a teeny tributary over in, uh, the, over in the Shields Valley. You can step over this in the summer, but it is incised like 15 feet because all that power is just locked into the straight channel. Drains quickly, super powerful. Um, this is Highlight Creek um, by the airport. Um, and the old channel actually is up on the other part of the screen and it was old and meandering, it has side channels, but uh, this landowner moved it here to reduce the flooding, I'm sure, and to dry things out. Um, but they overgrazed it, uh, they dug a really straight channel. And so now it's just really shallow water. There's no vegetation to shade it out and it drains really quickly and heats up really fast. And all that we're left with is uh, cheat grass. And our headwaters are not immune to this either. This is Storm Castle Creek. Um, a lot of our places got hammered pretty hard by logging um, by Plum Creek most recently. Um, there's an old log landing on the right here. It's now a campground, but the stream got pushed over out of the floodplain. They burned it on each side, so it's not gonna get out of that bur those berms anytime soon. It's starting to get its riparian vegetation back, which is great, but those lodgepole trees aren't very big and they probably aren't gonna fall in anytime soon unless, there's, unless we intervene or there's huge fire. So it's going to stay like that unless we do something. So showed you a lot of bad examples. How do we try and fix them? So there's like super heavy handed things, which are really necessary, especially when you're dealing with mine reclamation. Um, there's more low tech light touch stuff, which is more what I seem to do. Um, and then there's more passive methods as well. And so we're going to just run through those really quickly. So mine reclamation, um, where that adorable uh, lab is sitting is a, is a pile of mine tailings. Um, this was an old mine. This is a Nine Mile Creek. Um, it's a tributary to the Clark Fork. Um, our uh, colleague, um, Paul Parsons with Trout Unlimited, this has been his baby for like a really long time. I think he's on phase five of restoring this. And so when they, when they mined this, they, they dug out these pilings and they, and they pretty much straightened the stream out um, to get it out of the way so they could um, work with the material. And so Nine, Nine Mile Creek is pretty much a straight channel. Um, but Paul has done amazing things, and I think there's five miles now that they have re-dug re, um, a channel for. Um, they've thousands and thousands of willows that aren't growing up in this picture yet, but they'll get there. Um, the, the stream now is able to overtop its banks, spread out its power, um, and so it's really great usable habitat for fish. So now when the Clark Fork heats up, fish can move into here, and it's gonna be cooler water entering the, the Clark Fork than it was um, before this was done. And more water, and then we have to go to a video. So just bear with me for a second. So now on the lighter end of the restoration spectrum, uh, we've got projects where we make use of the natural materials around us. In this uh, video here, we're thinning trees from overstocked timber stands. These trees have encroached on the stream because it's been altered and no longer supporting the wet soils that uh, promote willow growth and things of that nature. So we're thinning the forest to improve its health and then also using those trees uh, to pull the wood into the stream. So that tool that we keep showing that's called a grip hoist. Uh, we just got funding from the local TU chapter to purchase one of those. So we're going to be building these log gems around here soon. But yeah, basically what we're doing is just um, it can pull up to 4,000 pounds. And so we're just pulling trees into the stream to recreate the log jams that would have been there historically and kind of just uh, 
adding that uh, process back into the stream so then it can be reconnected to its floodplain, um, slow down, spread out the water, keep it on a landscape longer, and really create some quality habitat for, uh, for, for trout. Uh, this video here, this is actually a local example. So this is up on um, near Big Sky. The Gallatin River Task Force did this project. Um, this is a restoration project. There was a, a degraded uh, old beaver meadow here. And so we're using timber that was removed for uh, a project where they were putting in a trail and this wood was just going to be burned. Um, it wasn't going to be used for lumber or anything like that. So we, we took it and we, we used the hydraulic post driver, uh, which I'll talk more about here in a second, but um, we, we use that to kind of anchor this wood in place and we build uh, uh, different structures to try and um, increase the sinuosity, so how much the stream meanders um, as it moves down and then that'll spread that water out onto the floodplain where it can be absorbed and also increase the dynamic habitat that probably would have been in this location uh, previously. And then uh, finally, sometimes, you know, we just need to, to act like beavers uh, or think like beavers. And so this, these are projects where we, we build beaver dam analogs. So these are, we're basically just mimi, uh, mimicking uh, beaver structures um, by driving in fence posts and then weaving them with native material. So in this scenario, overview photo, we put in the beaver dam analog, slows down, backs up the water. That makes the ground really moist, kills off those unwanted conifers, in come the willows and dogwoods, and hopefully that creates conditions where the beavers can come back and maintain and improve this habitat over the long term because they do a great job at it. So we sharpen these untreated fence posts. We use the hydraulic post driver to drive them into the ground. And then once we're in there, we use willows and dogwood to start um, weaving them in between that and slowing down and backing up the water. So this post pound is really heavy. It's like 70 pounds. Uh, I dropped one on my finger last year. I, I wouldn't advise that. Um, but you, you, you weave them through and this was a stream I could walk, I could step over before and now instantly we spread out and back up this water and it makes some really great habitat. And you know, the goal is to get those beavers back in the landscape. This is a project I did in, in Washington and within four years, beavers are back and building on this structure. Okay, that's the videos. Let me get back to the presentation, maybe. Okay, so um, alternatively, sometimes there's streams that aren't super degraded, they've just been overgrazed, and sometimes you can just plant them, which that sounds like it's not a lot of work, but it is a lot of work. Um, and so, you know, basically you can take an unhealthy stream and get it to a point where it's a healthy stream like this. You get willows and dogwoods coming back. They provide shade to the stream, so it cools it down. There's food for the beavers to move back in and start doing all their great things. When it floods and the water spreads out over the floodplain, it slows down as it encounters all those trees. So that's another great way to improve habitat for fish and also slow down and keep water on the landscape longer. Um, grazing management, I mentioned that grazing can, is, can be compatible with streams. These are called water gaps. You just give the cattle discrete access to a stream instead of allowing 300 head of cattle to just camp and sleep and do all their things in a stream all summer. So this way you protect the riparian area, you protect the stream channel, but the cows can still get to water. Um, and then uh, on the other side, uh, beaver management and relocation. So that beaver is, didn't die, don't freak out. Uh, so he's being trapped to be re relocated. Um, but uh, beavers, are, they do great things, like I've said, but they also can be a huge nuisance. There's certain places where they just don't get along with folks. But where we can, uh, where they don't get along, hopefully you can trap them and move them. They did a lot of this in Yellowstone Park and they've been successful. Um, but also, in place management is where you know there's beavers they've showed up because the habitat's great if you kill the beaver you're going to get another one back in there at some point so you might as well find a way to kind of coexist with them so you can wrap your trees so they don't bite them you can uh build or eat them you can build different structures to try and pr to prevent them from clogging culverts and causing flooding this thing here is called a pond leveler you can put it in and actually set the water level for their ponds so they can still have water but it doesn't flood so much that you know it's filling your basement for example so you can find different ways to, to coexist with beavers and that's a really great uh, way to, to allow them to stick around and, and improve habitat um, without having to trap them. So the idea with a lot of those like lower tech or like, you know, cost effective ones where we're just putting in trees or beaver dams is that you put in these structures and these simplified straight uh, degraded channels, the high flows interact with them, that reintroduces the meander back into them. And then eventually over time, you create conditions where the riparian vegetation comes back. And then hopefully the beavers come back or eventually they'll start recruiting new trees that are falling into the stream. And then the, the stream will just be healthy going forward. 
So again, this is kind of, you know, I just, I like to show this because this is what, um, this is what a healthy stream looks like. And in many of our minds, we're so stuck in that single thread channel uh, state of mind because that's what we've seen forever. Um, but in reality is a lot of our streams, except, especially our wide valley bottom streams in Montana would have looked a lot like this. Okay, so then reconnecting habitat. Um, culverts are everywhere underneath uh, roads. And when they're installed in, in correctly, they can create barriers to fish trying to move upstream. So when it's really hot in the summer and fish are trying to find cold water, they can't get to it. So this is Olson Creek. It's a tributary to, the, to Bridger Creek. You drive over it when you're going up to Ski Bridger Bowl. Um, we lease water on this stream and uh, trout hang out right below it trying to jump up it and I watch them all the time and they can't make it. I feed them grasshoppers though, so they don't go hungry. Um, but this is a great example of where if you could do something like this, you know, put in a larger culvert or a bridge or something like that, or a culvert that has bed material through it, those fish can move up and down through this, access the cold water and the good habitat upstream, and they aren't, um, they don't know the difference at this point. Um, on a much larger scale, uh, our colleagues over in Missoula, uh, Rob Roberts um, with Trout Unlimited, did this really huge project. This is Rattlesnake Dam. Um, this, this dam no longer functioned. It was at risk of failing and, um, and impacting downstream residents. So the community wanted to get rid of it, and it was a seasonal passage barrier to fish. So um, this had been there for a long time. Um, Rob got a bunch of funding, and they basically removed the dam and built a whole new channel for it. And so now fish have access to 10 miles upstream. So this is a great um, example of where fish, you know, you, it takes a lot of work, but if you can just remove some impediments, it's a lot more cost effective than restoring 10 miles of habitat. So um, I meant, uh, you might've saw an asterisk earlier next to the reconnect um, when I said reconnecting was the solution to things. Um, the problem is um, for some of our native fish spe species like uh, cut our cutthroat trout, um, they don't do the greatest with reconnect all the time. Um, because they're in competition with our introduced species for food and also for space. So they occupy very similar habitat. So they'll get pushed out often by these other, by our introduced species because there's way more of them than there are native species now. So they can get displaced that way. Additionally, uh, rainbow trout are very closely related to cutthroat trout and they can, they can breed together and they can hybridize and that's always to the detriment of our native fish because there's far fewer of them. So um, we would have had at one point in time, um, West Slope cutthroat would have been found from Missouri headwaters all the way down, down to Great Falls. Now we only have them left in a few like teeny tributaries all over the place. And the few that we have left is because we've been protecting them. So um, how we've protected them so that we can keep some of our native fish around is uh, emulating nature again. So this is a waterfall, Yellowstone Falls. Um, so waterfalls do a great job in some places um, where they prevent upstream migration of introduced species from intermingling or impacting our native fish species. So these projects have been done all over the state. This is just a local one. This is North Fork Spanish Creek. This is on um, the Flying D Turner's Ranch. And so uh, this is a designed fish passage barrier. So this prevents non-native fish from moving upstream to get to the, the cutthroat that we are protecting upstream so they don't get outcompeted and, and hybridized. So yeah, specifically designed so fish cannot jump over this. So like the engineers spend a lot of time and money uh, designing these. So this is a new project, it's not completed yet. That barrier went in, I think two years ago. Last year, they finished up removing non-native fish. Uh, this year, they're planning to put uh, the West Slope cutthroat back into it, and then they'll recolonize 17 miles of stream habitat where they can you know, do their thing unimpeded and we can keep these native fish around. Um, Turner Ranch, those folks were great um, with helping to get this barrier installed. It, they like to, I mean, Turner apparently really likes to fish for, uh, for wild, for native fish, but also it provides a bunch of public water as well, all that green is forest surface. Um, so with that, that's kind of like my spiel. Um, but uh, now I just always like to end talks with kind of like, you know, what you can do. Because um, I've said a lot of things that are dire and stuff like that, but really trout are going to be around Montana for a very long time. And we can play a role in, in making sure that they're more resilient. So the biggest thing that I think you can do um, is conserve water. Um, this is probably the number one biggest thing you can do. Um, so this might sound challenging or a pain for some of you, but it's, it's really not. And in many ways, it makes your life a lot easier. So um, one thing you can just plant drought tolerant plants. For example, my house, I have two dogs. I need some lawn for them to run around on, but I don't need my lawn that's in the front yard. So I'm gonna tear all that out, put in rock and drought tolerant plants. I don't have to mow it as much. I can fish and hunt more, it's great. Um, 
Also, water during cooler hours of the day. It drives me nuts driving around town. It's the middle of the day and people are watering their lawns. Most of that water evaporates before it ever reaches the roots. If you water during night or in the evenings or in the morning, that water has a chance to soak in the soil and actually get to your plants. So that saves you a ton of money on your water um, bills and it is, it is better for keeping more water in the stream. Um, and also this water timer, that's $27 for that one. I have like four of these. Um, they're so easy. You can just, you can program uh, watering uh, sessions or like if you're just moving a sprinkler around your yard, I just turn it on for half an hour. Cause I can't tell you how many times I've had every intention of going back and turning off a sprinkler and then it ran for like the entire night. And I waste all a bunch of money and my lawn is soaked. So um, th those things are great. And then um, drip irrigation. So um, in, in my yard, I planted a ton of little native plants everywhere last year and they're all on drip irrigation. So I have it all set up and programmed. They get watered every three days um, by this little thing. You just program it super easy. Again, $27, now I don't have to move water around my yard. So um, also your grass, most species can handle going dormant during the summer, as long as you aren't trampling them or having your dogs run all over them. Um, it's okay for your grass to turn brown for short periods of time, or you can just reduce your frequency of watering. Also, Bozeman adopted the every other day watering policy. I think that's something that's really great because you don't need to water your grass every single day. Um, and then when you're fishing, which I'm assuming a lot of you are interested in fishing, um, try and minimize stress on fish when it starts getting warmer. Um, use the appropriate equipment. Don't go fishing for trophy brown trout with a three weight. Um, it's just going to stress them out and you might lose them. Um, also just try and land fish really quickly. That plays into the using appropriate gear. Uh, keep them in the water as much as possible. If you have to, you know, take a trophy hero picture with it, just lift it up real quick and then put it right back in the water. It's fine. Um, take photos quickly and then release them quickly. Send them on their way. Try and put them in moving water so that they have more oxygen. If you put them in like some stagnant pool, they're not gonna do too great. Um, and then this is like kind of a great policy to follow. Um, I might be the nerdiest one in the room. I, I walk around with a thermometer when I go fishing in the summer. Um, I have some up here if you don't have one, if you'd like one. Um, but basically I just, I just measure stream, uh, stream temperature. For me, anytime it's getting around 63 degrees, I actually stop fishing or move somewhere else. But our policy is pretty much 67 degrees or above, you should not be fishing. Um, and in that kind of yellow zone in there, you should be considering doing something different. In the green zone, feel free to fish to your heart's content. You're probably not gonna be harming fish. Um, also, um, in the summer months, people get really stressed out when they can't fish our, our lower rivers. I find it as an opportunity to go explore new water, check out our abundant alpine lakes and our amazing tributaries. Coming from Washington, some of our little dinky tributaries are like, would be some of the best trout streams in like the whole state of Washington. So we are incredibly lucky to have the trout streams that we have here, or just like shoot your bow like I do in August. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, advocate for our streams. Um, FWP, uh, Montana Fish or Fish, Wildlife and Parks, they have a grant program where they provide funding for, for stream restoration. Um, you can comment on those proposals. You can read them. You can learn about our restoration projects and you can comment them and tell the commissioners that you want them to, uh, to fund that project. So that's a cool thing that you can do. Um, you know, you can reach out to your local representatives. It's really hard to stay up on all the different stuff that's going on, especially right now. Um, but there's tons of groups out there that make it easy. You can follow Montana Trout Unlimited has like action alerts that they put out all the time when there's policies that are rel related relative to things that we're interested in. Montana uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers does a great job as well. So there's a ton of local organizations that you can, you can follow and they'll keep you up to speed while we're all very busy. Uh, shameless plug, you can join uh, Madison Gallatin Trout Unlimited. Um, the local chapter, uh, there's a sign up sheet for them out there. You can actually fill out, there's a little card and you can get a free membership if you want. There's some out there on the table, um, but they do a great stuff. They do all kinds of different, they had a fundraiser. They raised over $130,000 that'll go to, to restoration work here locally uh, just a couple weeks ago when they had their banquet and they do river cleanups. They help us with restoration projects. They do a lot of great stuff. And then if you don't like Trout Unlimited, I'm cool with that, that's fine. Um, there's something like 900 nonprofits in Bozeman um, and a lot of them care about the environment. So, you know, the Conservation District does great work. I guess they're not a nonprofit, but you know, um, the Galton River Task Force up in the, up in uh, around Big Sky, they do fantastic work. I work the Galton Watershed Council all the time. The Audubon Society, what's good for fish is usually good for birds. So um, there's so many um, great organizations out there if you wanna get involved and do something. And then lastly, 
um, all the different things I said that were good for the fish are good for all of us. Um, you know, my family hanging out by the stream, enjoying themselves, like that's that's what we're protecting rivers for. Uh, wildlife, whether you're birds or mule deer, you need to go to a river now and then. Um, more water in the streams is better for our agricultural community so they continue being functional. And then of course, water comes back to our tap eventually. So all those different things, they might seem like big, big things to hop on board with, but really they benefit our whole community. So with that, happy to take questions. And if you want to follow us on social media, there's those things. Okay, good. Thank you, Kanda. That was really, really interesting, really amazing. No um, okay, so we're now on to our question and answer. Um, so um, all of you in the audience here, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone here to you. And I really want you to use the microphone so people online can hear what you're saying too. And uh, also I'll be alternating with people online too. So anyone, oh, I see a hand, a couple of hands up here already. I'll start in the back and move forward. Here we go. Let's see if. So first of all, I just wanted to say thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. It was for really sure. informative. Um, I'm wondering if there are any prospects of helping our younger community members kind of realize the problem that is building and going to take some time to develop and maybe getting some of our younger community members involved with the outreach. Yeah, um, there, there definitely is. Um, Montana De Trout Unlimited does a great, I work for Trout Unlimited National, it's very confusing. Um, but Montana Trout Unlimited does a lot of great kids programs. Um, they have a, like a kids summer camp that they do out at Georgetown Lake and, and teach them to fish and learn all about the aquatic environment, stuff like that, and getting them involved in early age. I don't know how much they go into climate change and things like that, honestly. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Like the volunteer opportunities that I have usually include hammers. So that's not great for little kids. But um, I would say starting out by going to, you know, like going to Earth Day and things like that and just get involved with anything that, that grabs their attention and hopefully they'll eventually come around to, to caring about our streams. But that's a, that's a great question. Okay, um, one more question in the audience here, then we'll go to online. Hi, uh, thank you very much. That was, that was an amazing presentation. Um, uh, I'm an engineer, I've previously worked in watershed planning. Um, and one of the things, you know, there's a lot of great um, examples of physical restorations, um, but when you take a step back and look at the larger scale, are there comprehensive watershed plans in Montana? Um, you know, it seems like it'd be really helpful to be able to prioritize or, you know, understand the risks, quantify the risks for the watershed and sort of prioritize them as well as the restoration opportunities. Mm -hmm. And typically that's at the level of like a watershed planning unit. And, I, and I'm not sure what the authority in Montana is for sure. that type of thing. So I'm, I'm curious about that and, and what you think about that. Yeah, so you're totally right. Um, we need those big planning documents, especially to get a bunch of different minds in the room and organizations working on things together. Um, there's a, there's, there are watershed um, restoration plans that include pretty much a lot of the stuff that we're talking about that would improve um, water temperatures and water storage and all those different kind of things. They are called restoration plans, but I mean, they're getting at all the same things. Um, there's uh, locally, there's one for the lower Gallatin. There's also one for the upper Gallatin. You can find them online if you'd like to read them. Um, the lower Gallatin one is due for an update. Um, the Gallatin Watershed Council is in charge of, of putting that together. They're working on it right now. They've actually formate, uh, formulated this new group. It's called Gallatin Water Collaborative. I know that's confusing. It's like the same acronym. Um, but, and so that's a group of like pretty much everything, everybody in the community uh, getting together and prioritizing just like what you're talking about. And um, we've got we've got folks from the ag community, we've got conservation groups, we've got state agencies, we've got federal agencies, and we're trying to work together to try and come up with solutions um, to try and um, improve water um, storage and, and water health in the area. So um, you can find that website online too. Um, so it's the Galton Water Collaborative and kind of find out on some of their stuff. And I believe you can get involved and join the collaborative if you're interested. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big problem and it takes a lot of, a lot of big ideas and, and there are some big ideas out there more than I could talk about tonight. Um, Trout Unlimited and Four Corners Foundation and some other folks are actually working on this, um, trying to 
create a water bank actually where we can help um, buy and sell water from uh, irrigators and support um, moving water to other places where they need it, but also finding ways to keep more water in stream. So, but that's like this huge multi-year um, planning thing that's barely even getting off the ground right now. So there's folks working on it, but it's, it's it, there's a lot, of, lot to do. That's a great question. Great, thanks Connor. Uh, um, Rich, we're gonna go and see, um, go to online questions now. Okay, um, Alexandra asks, are there funding sources we can explore for lining irrigation canals and putting the water in pipes? And she's particularly interested in Big, Big Timber Creek, which is a tributary of the Yellowstone. Sure. Um, yeah, the, the NRCS, um, Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, they do a, a ton of that work. And so um, I, I don't work over in Big Timber. It's, you know, it, it's pretty close by. Uh, it's not keeping travel limited from working over there at all, but I'm not really familiar what's what's going on over there um, as much. But, um, but yeah, the NRCS works all over the place. They change their priority watersheds is what I'm understanding and also what type of projects they're working on. But um, that's a federal program that provides a lot of cost share um, with producers to help improve their operations and also conserve our natural resources. So that's that's would be the main one that I would I would look to. Okay, do we have a sec another question online? Yes, uh, Angela asks, if browns and rainbows will be better able to survive in climate change, does it make sense to prioritize re-enhancement of native cutthroat habitat, for example, in the North Fork of the Blackfoot in the Lamar Valley in the, in the Yellowstone National Park, for example, by killing non-native fish? Yeah, and so um, that that's happening um, to an extent. So um, I'm more familiar. I work more on the on the West Slope cutthroat side, but I live in Livingston, so I try and stay up on all the Yellowstone cutthroat work. Um, but basically, there there's a plan in place. I think you can find uh, fresh or Montana. Um, Fish and Wildlife's um, plan online, but they have cutthroat restoration plans. Um, and a lot of those include going through and, and dealing with non-native species and trying to get out there and then find places that are gonna remain cold through climate change and then try and protect them. Um, it is a little bit challenging. Those fish barriers I showed you, we can't just install them anywhere. One, they're expensive, but you have to put them in certain places where some flood event isn't gonna do an end round around them, around them and waste all the money that you invested. So you have to find the right location. It's gotta be a cold stream. Um, and it's got to have a lot of stream miles for it and make sense. But uh, for West Slope Cutthroat, I know um, uh, FWP is shooting for 20% uh, of, of Cutthroat to be in their 20% of the remaining tributaries that are suitable for Cutthroat to, um, to become cutthroat like strongholds where they put in these fish barriers or protect them in some way or another. Um, in the Madison, actually, they're, um, I think we're like could be wrong. Don't get mad at me, Mike. Um, like uh, 50 miles away from reaching that 20% goal. Um, there are quite a few uh, cutthroat populations in the headwaters there. Uh, the Gallatin's lagging way behind, so we've got some work to do there. Um, the Yellowstone, like I said, I'm not quite as familiar with it. Uh, it's, it doesn't seem like the Yellowstone cutthroat are doing quite as bad with the hybridization as the West Slope cutthroat are. There's some time, spawn timing differences that seem to help them, but there are some issues where they're running into each other. But like most of the Shields River um, actually has a fish barrier on it. So that's like a really huge um, Yellowstone cutthroat refuge. Um, Yellowstone National Park is a pretty huge one. Uh, Yellowstone Falls protects all those fish that are up in um, Yellowstone Lake. So um, there's some really great strongholds for Yellowstone cutthroat, but they're always working to expand them. Great, thanks. Uh, we have another question here in our audience here. Hi, yes, thank you. That was an excellent talk. Um, I didn't hear anything, correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't think I heard you mention anything about the effect of climate change on the aquatic insects that trout depend on. Since they have distinct seasonality and, um, and aren't quite as mobile during the course of the seasons as a trout, what's the different, well, will they be able to respond to the restoration work that you're talking about so that that doesn't become a the dominant effect of climate change on the trout distributions. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great great question, and I'll do my best to answer. I'm in no way an expert when it comes to macroinvertebrates. Um, water temperature definitely impacts them. Um, they have the same problem with getting oxygen. They have their own gills. Stone flies to the point. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there's some stone fly species that'll start doing push-ups when they're low on oxygen to get water pumping past their gills. It's pretty cool. Um, but but yeah, they're impacted by climate change as well. 
Um, and while the cool thing about them is their habit of flying upstream, right? Like, especially the ones like stoneflies and salmon flies and things like that. Those um, species do excellent at recolonizing streams when, they're, when they get wiped out for one reason or another. So um, from my understanding, we aren't super concerned about, you know, them being able to recolonize things. But I know there's some students at MSU. Um, there's a gal, actually, she's on the board for the Galton Watershed um, Council. And she's doing a master's degree on, like, timing and, and, um, and different things related to uh to i think salmon flies and when they when they hatch out different times so there's folks definitely monitoring that at the university but i'm, I'm sorry i can't give you a better answer on it but that's a great question uh thanks connor we have another question online rich yes jared asks how can we financially support your organization and the habitat restoration projects that you do Sure. Thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, so uh, Jared's my old roommate, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so um, yeah, there's there's great ways you, you can you can donate um, to us. Um, there's um, out there on those, I have brochures out on the table and there's a little QR code on the back and you can scan them and, and download it. Um, but also just getting involved with Trout Unlimited, they do all kinds of great fundraisers. Um, the local chapter does, and, and we request funding from them at different times. Um, if you're uh, well off and you can donate large amounts of money, you can come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jared. <laughs> uh, okay, we have another question here in our audience here. Hi, and thank you very much. Uh, I don't really have a question, but uh, I know you are interested in history. And um, I worked for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and Trout Habitat Restoration in the early 1970s. And of course, that's a completely different situation than we have out here. Yes. We did a lot of driving cedar posts into the sandy stream bed and then building stump covers and islands and all that. Mm -hmm. And if you're ever interested in that, just from a historical perspective, uh, a good friend of mine, Bill Buck, was the guy who spearheaded that project. Okay. Uh, and he's an old Navy fighter pilot. He's in his 90s now, but he would love to talk about it any time if, yeah. if you're interested. Of course. I'm yeah. always interested. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, come and find me. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions here? I don't see any hands. Oh, here we go. Another one. Um, I just have a question for you personally, uh, yeah. like looking forward to this uh, summer and the next couple of years, what projects or sites are you most excited about around Bozeman? Sure. Yeah. So um, my position just started a few years ago, so it kind of takes a few years to get projects rolling, but um, I've got some coming up. So that's a great question. We have a, a project over on Dry Creek, which is a tributary to the East Galton River on the north side of the valley. Um, we've done a few stages of restoration there. I'm gonna, we're gonna do a third stage of restoration there uh, in the coming year or this fall. We're gonna do a lot of that earthwork, um, which I, I'm super excited about. Um, I have another project that I just got funded that's right in town actually, which is gonna be a really cool volunteer opportunity, um, Mandeville Creek. Um, it joins the East Galton River right around where the Cherry River fishing access is. There's like seventh and frontage right there. And there's a big, huge field that's getting developed. Um, but as part of that development, they're leaving um, a pretty substantial setback around there because of how much wetland habitat is there. So there, I think there's 28 acres there that they aren't able to develop. And Mandeville Creek goes through it. And I just got a grant funding to do restoration on 1.2 miles of stream there, um, which is pretty, it's going to be a pretty cool project. There's going to be like community trails along and stuff too. It'll be a neat community thing. And then um, there's this other project, Ray Creek, uh, which we've been working on, which actually is a spring creek that starts in the Madison Valley and, and joins the Gallatin. Uh, we've been doing a little bit of fundraising for it. And that goes through public land and um, could be a pretty awesome public spring fishery, spring creek fishery, um, that, that hopefully we can get funded here shortly. And then recently out of the Infrastructure Act, um, the, the government's kind of come around the idea that um, streams also are infrastructure. Um, the, the water, if we can slow it down and it takes more time to get out, that benefits the community like we're talking about. And then also um, it traps sediment and things of that nature as well, reduces flooding impacts. So they've, they've kind of come around to the idea that if we do habitat restoration in the headwaters, it can benefit communities downstream and keep our reservoirs from filling in with sediment and things of that nature. So there's actually a partnership between the Forest Service and um, and Trout Unlimited um, with some specific funding going to projects to work um, on the Forest Service. And so uh, you, those that video, I really like cutting down trees and putting them in streams and doing all that kind of stuff, like kid in the sandbox. So um, so I'm hoping to get a bunch of those projects go, here going in the future too. So yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. 
Great, I think we'll take uh, one more question comment from online and then see if there's a last question here to finish up in the audience. Cool. Yes, Alex has a comment. Um, says, thank you for the excellent presentation. Economists, fish and beavers all say that to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and stabilize our climate, we need a carbon fee and cash back. Uh, I'd love to have people to check it out and ask our members of Congress to support it. Thank you again. Thanks for the comment. Yeah, and thanks for that comment. I um, know that Montana Trout Unlimited actually has endorsed that um, policy. So there you go. Um, one last question here from the audience, perhaps. Do we see any more hands? Oh, here we go. What is the largest impediment to getting restoration projects up and running? Is it funding? Is it local policy? Is it landowners? Just curious to hear what prevents this from rolling out more quickly. I've read, I think it's the Upper Gallatin um, Watershed Restoration Plan, and it sounds like they've been planning that for like almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously it's very important to like take your time and go slowly, but it seems, I, I imagine that there's maybe something that is impeding that from kind of going full steam ahead. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And um, yeah, it's kind of all those things. Um, one of the big thing is, is funding. So one of the cool things, and I'm not just talking about Sims because they have helped pay for my position, but um, really one of, one of the big things that, that helps is just having capacity to go work on these projects. Um, uh, most of our grant fundings that we write, um, they don't really like to pay for capacity. Most of the time they like to, they like to pay for projects to get done. And so they're really happy when you bring a developed project to them. But um, things like that plan that you're talking about, that has all these little ideas that are all over out there, but the, the money to get that idea to an actual like plan where you can get grant funding requested takes a lot of time and money. And so like, you know, like last year I spent a whole week just running around looking at streams, trying to come up with my own projects. If, if I don't have base funding to cover that time, then I, I can't do that. And so one of the, I think one of the biggest imped impediments is the lack of staff capacity um, to go out and pursue these projects and see them all the way through. Um, so that, that goes with the funding. Uh, there's tons of funding out there to do different projects, actually. Um, there's, there's been more and more out of this Infrastructure Act. There's a lot of really cool funding opportunities out there, but the capacity for people to go out, develop these projects, and then apply for grants and project manage them is really, really challenging. So I'd say that's kind of the biggest one. Great, well, thank you so much, Connor. And um, it was really great discussion. Thank you, audience. So, uh, uh, I, I just want to let you know that um, tonight's event was recorded, so um, if it'll be available on the Gallatin Valley Earth Day website in a few days. If you did register for the event, then we will be sending you a follow-up email with a link to that recording and some other resources. Um, I just wanted to alert you that we have yet another great um, trout and climate talk coming up in a few weeks on Thursday, March 30th, right here again in the Hope Lutheran Church and also online. And the study I talked about earlier, um, we'll have the lead author of that study, uh, Tim Klein here. He has now left the USGS since writing that um, report and he is now a fish ecologist professor here at Montana State. So that should be a really fascinating, another really fascinating talk. An awesome scientist, like I can't touch Tim's science. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay. so I invite you to come back here again, either online or in person, and uh, please check out our website for additional events. And thank you all for coming again and have a great evening. We'll see you here on the 30th.